All right, thanks everybody. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about high throughput plant phenotyping and uh, um, this is a really broad topic and so I'm just gonna kind of narrow it down to a few of the topics that uh, my lab specifically works with uh, within. And so the first thing some of you might ask and you know, what's a phenotype? And so a phenotype could uh, pretty much be anything, right? And so here's just a list of things that I came up with and I don't think I'm a terribly creative person. And so this probably only represents a very small percentage of what would constitute um, a, a phenotype. And of course, of course, I'm not gonna go over all these in, in full detail. What I'm really just gonna focus on for this you know, bioenergy 101 talk is um, uh, really two types of measurements, um, passive high throughput phenotyping and what we might be able to uh, want to get from that. Um, and then what I would consider to be active um, measurements for high throughput phenotyping. And I'm gonna keep something of a um, focus for field research um, rather than for artificial growth environments. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of these techniques can be applied in pretty much any environment, greenhouse, growth chamber, um, along with a few adaptations or modifications. And so um, the passive measurements are generally reflective, ba reflect, reflectance-based uh, spectral analysis. And so this is really just looking at what's being reflected up from the plants. And so I call it passive uh, because the sun's doing all the work and the plants are just there and they're reflecting or they're not reflecting um, based on, on, on wavelength. Um, or, well, they're reflecting at all wavelengths, but how much they reflect is gonna, is gonna be highly variable. Um, and then there's uh, the active measurements, which I'm gonna talk about LIDAR, where um, we actually have a sensor that shoots out a, a, a photon and, and the sensor measures how long does it take for that photon to come back. Um, and then um, there's also what plants might be emitting. And so, you know, plants absorb sunlight and um, they, they fluoresce, the chlorophyll fluoresces, and so that, that's a phenotype that can be useful, um, as well as thermal information. And again, this is going to be very 30,000-foot um, uh, uh, view here. Um, and so talking about the um, reflectance-based principles, I mean, this is, this is a solar spectrum, and so what you'll see in the solar spectrum, there are actually three lines here. There's the black body um, radiation, which is the, the black line, and that's if we have some um, black body that's at 5,778 Kelvin. Um, that's, what it would, that's what it would emit, right? Um, then you have the, the, the yellow shaded pattern, which is actually what satellites measure above the Earth's atmosphere, and then you have the red, which represents what um, sensors down at, at the surface of the Earth will, will measure. And so this, this red is what drives um, ecosystem functioning or plant functioning. It's got all the wavelengths that we use, plants use for photosynthesis. Um, it has heat that plants use to keep warm. A lot of that energy is gonna go into evaporation, into sensible heat, photosynthesis, metabolism, these types of things. And so, um, you know, I, I, just to take a little bit of a step back, you know, I, you, you've probably, most of you probably know this, but for those who don't, there are two different terminologies that we're going to use um, in terms of spectral analysis. And so one of them is multispectral, um, and, and it says imaging, it doesn't have to be imaging. Um, and then there's, there's hyperspectral, and the big difference between the two of these is how many different wave bands are you going to measure within a spectrum of interest. And so, you consider the sun's going to emit from, let's say, 380 to 2,500 nanometers. Um, uh, and so do you only have maybe on the, on the left side, do we only have six bands that are being measured, which would be multispectral? Or on the right, are we going to have something in the order of 800 bands that are being measured? And so that's hyperspectral. And so um, you'll see from these examples that there's these layers, right? And so on the X and, the, um, X, um, and, and Y um, at axes, uh, that would be, in an imaging sense, um, that would be like uh, looking down at a plant canopy. And in the, the z-axis, that's going to be different wave bands of interest. And so when you look at a hyperspectral analysis that's imaging-based, you're going to have what's called a hypercube. And so this, again, is, is, is x and y. Um, the plane is going to be what you're imaging, and then the, the depth is going to be all the different wave bands that you're, that you're measuring. And so this is kind of what a typical um, uh, spectral um, measurement of, of a plant, of a leaf, is going to look like. And so, again, going along the x-axis, we're going from about roughly th 380 nanometers um, all the way to uh, about 2,500 nanometers. I know my axes are too small and I have to break out my readers to read what's on the screen. So. Um, and, and generally speaking, we break these different wavelength, um, these, this, this spectrum into three different um, uh, areas of interest. And so the, the far left is going to be the leaf pigments. You'll notice that um, there's uh, um, the amount of, uh, of reflectance on the y-axis is really low from about 400 to 700 nanometers. Well, that's the visible spectrum. That's what we see. But that's also what plants use for photosynthesis. 
And so plants don't want to reflect a whole lot in those wavelengths because that's what drives their growth. Um, and then once you get to the, um, uh, the, the mid-range from let's say 700 um, up to about maybe 1,000, 1,200 nanometers, um, that has a lot of information in that reflectance that relates to the cell structure. And then once you get beyond about 1,000, 1,200 nanometers, then there's information related potentially to the water status of the plant. And so these are some generalities um, that can be used. And, and so again, this is kind of small and I'm not going to go into huge detail with this, but I just pulled a bunch of papers that use spectral analysis on plants uh, just to give some examples of what you might get. And so the upper left hand corner, um, those, that's rice at different developmental stages. And then the top middle, um, that's going to be um, a, a bunch of different crop species. Um, on, the, on the far right, um, that's going to be different nitrogen applications. Um, in the bottom left, um, you know, again, you're, you're looking at difference in spectrum uh, related to water stress. In the bottom right, that has to do with ozone stress. And, and it doesn't really matter what, what, what these treatments are. What it does show is that different species, different treatments, different growth environments actually cause a change in that reflectance spectrum for these plants. And the idea is to use that information in a way um, that can allow us to understand what's happening with the plant without having to go out there and collect a leaf punch or, or harvest the whole plant or put a gas exchange system on there to see what's going on or to walk through with a leaf area index. All these traditional techniques that are really labor intensive and, and time consuming. Um, if you could just do a quick spectral scan of a field, um, then you're, you're able to get this information in, in a much more high throughput manner. And so here's an example throughout history. Um, these have been, this technique, this is remote sensing. It's been done at aircraft and satellite scales for decades. Um, and on the right, there's just a number of different types of, 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 um, of, of uh, metrics that are being used. And these are generally categorized as reflectance indices, right? And so um, if you uh, uh, take a wavelength at, you know, um, or a measurement at, let's say, the, the red wavelengths and one at the um, near infrared wavelengths, and you do a comparison of those two things, you might be able to understand something related to how much plant material is there. And so, I'm, you know, and so these are just very simple index-based things, just a ratio or a ratio of ratios of different wave bands at different parts of the reflectance spectrum. On um, the bottom left, this is something that still, my lab has been doing, it's still reflectance um, indices-based approaches, but rather than just looking at um, sort of the big wave band um, in the red versus the far red, um, you could look at um, very specific wave bands over the whole range, in this case it's from about 300 to about 900 nanometers. And you could start to see where are their hot spots of information in, in various different uh, reflectance indices that can be used. And so again, these are very basic indices-based approach, but this is using much higher end sensors than the satellites or aircraft have, have historically been using. But it's not just these simple indices that, that can be informative. Um, with the dawn of, of applying machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques to uh, plant sciences, particularly with high-throughput phenotyping, we're now able to get an understanding of what's happening to, for example, underlying photosynthetic physiology based on nothing more than measuring the reflectance of, of sunlight from the leaves. And so on the left here, these are um, three axes. And so the x-axis, which is um, um, in the bottom axis, that's wavelength of reflectance. And then going back into the slide, um, in the y-axis, um, that's a value of VC max um, that's been um, um, uh, measured. And of course, in the, the, the z-axis, that's um, uh, uh, the, the intensity of the wavelength. And, and so we don't really get anything meaningful from looking at this left figure. What it's showing you is that for the you know, number of different, this is tobacco, a number of different um, cultivars of tobacco, um, we're able to see that there are slight variations in um, in the spectral reflectance of those leaves. Um, but what's interesting is that using a machine learning approach, this was a partial least squares approach, we can actually infer what's happening with photosynthetic physiology, um, the VC max in this case, the maximum rate of carboxylation of rubisco, simply from making spectral analysis. And certainly, you know, my group's not the first one to sh show this. This has been done quite extensively on a number of different ecosystems. And, and, and you know, the, the, the upside is it seems to work pretty well. Um, and it's really quick and it's really effective. The downside is we don't really know what it's measuring. We don't know what it's telling us except that there's this, the machine, the artificial intelligence says there's this relationship. And so on the right, this is just showing you the relative importance, the, what, the, what the artificial intelligence output is telling you is the relative importance of different wavelengths in inferring something like VC max. And so some wavelengths, you know, are much more important than others. And of course, I don't have a pointer, so I can't really show that. <clears throat> 
And so that's kind of the reflectance-based approach. And, it's, and, and again, for a 10-minute Bioenergy 101, it's 30,000-foot view. There's a lot that goes into this, and, and I really can't get into those details. Getting a little bit on the active side of things, um, this is a, a, a paper that was published a few years ago using what's called solar-induced fluorescence. And this is nothing more than chlorophyll fluorescence. Um, and so leaves absorb sunlight. That sunlight is used to dry photochemistry, but some of it goes to heating up the leaf, and some of it is emitted as uh, fluorescence in, um, in a, a, the red, a little bit far red. And uh, some researchers have shown that you can actually use this as a proxy for ecosystem scale um, uh, productivity, gross primary product uh, productivity. And, um, and so that's what these bottom figures are showing you, is on the left, it's the solar-induced fluorescence across the United States. On the right, um, it's what's uh, modeled using um, uh, ecosystem-based produ production models. And the idea here is that um, you know, these two correlate ex exceptionally well. Um, and so solar-induced fluorescence is being used more, in is increasingly used as a proxy for canopy photosynthesis. Um, it's interesting because this technique allows satellites to measure gross primary productivity um, across the entire planet. And so this is extremely high throughput, and it covers the entire planet. And this was just a, um, a figure that was put together um, a few years ago in PNAS, and it's actually showing you at the peak what is the, the solar-induced fluorescence at the peak uh, productivity for all the ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystems on the planet. Um, and what I found really interesting about this, which I suppose everyone in the room is probably aware of, is that the Midwestern United States, at its peak physiological activity, is the most productive ecosystem on the planet. Um, but one of the things my lab wanted to do, um, and this is a lot of collaboration with Kai Yuan's lab, is to scale this down to see whether we can, rather than looking at global photosynthesis, can we use this technique in a diversity plot to measure gross primary productivity um, in, let's say, 900 different uh, genotypes of, of sorghum. And so we built this cart um, that has the um, same sensors that you would have on the satellite with spectrometer, one looking up, one looking down. Um, and then, you know, it's very difficult to toggle out this very small signal um, of what's coming out from fluorescence from all the reflected light, um, but it is possible. Um, and so this is one of the, 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 the active measurements that you can, you can try to um, use to, you know, infer differences from um, one, one plot to the next. Um, and then uh, thermal imagery is also really important. And so, again, just like the sun is at, what, 5,800 Kelvin, um, and therefore it emits radiation, and we can see that radiation, at least in the visible wave band, um, every single one of you are also emitting photons, right? But, of course, we can't see them. When we see each other, we're seeing the reflected light. We're not seeing what you're emitting because we're not 5,800 Kelvin, all right? Um, but nevertheless, there are sensors, thermal cameras, that can measure um, in, in the, in the uh, wavelengths of, that relate to the temperature of, 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 a, um, of an organism or of a surface. And so this is actually work that Andrew Leakey's lab does uh, quite a bit on, is thermal imagery using um, drones. And, and because plants use a lot of water, in fact, almost, I don't know, um, not half, but a significant portion of the energy that, that canopies absorb go into evaporating water. The more water that canopy evaporates, the cooler the canopy is going to be. And so you could use this technique to look at, with closed canopies, um, relative differences in water use um, instantaneously, assuming you can get enough of these different um, um, uh, plots in, 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 your, um, in your field of view from the, from the imaging device. And so again, I would classify this as being an active um, measurement technique. And then there's LIDAR. And so as I said earlier on when I first started, LIDAR, it's, it's, a, it's a really fun technique. Um, this is, I think, the plant biology community is benefiting enormously from autonomous vehicles um, because this technology has really taken off with the dawn of autonomous vehicles and a way of making sure that these big five, 6,000-pound chunks of metal moving across the street aren't going to plow into buildings or people or other cars. And so they use LIDAR, and it's light detection and ranging. It's just like radar but with photons. And it's actually really cool technology because it actually can measure the speed of light. And so if I have a LIDAR and it's going to shoot a laser against that back wall, it's going to reflect off that back wall and come back this way. And um, how quickly that happens um, is measured by, by this device. And what's really cool about these LIDARs is the first one we use shoots out a laser and it spins. And so it's kind of like you're getting a, like a, I don't know, you think like a microtome for those who've done slide analysis. And so then what you'd have to do is you'd have to move it in order to kind of get a bunch of slices to piece together a three-dimensional structure. You know, the ones we have now are actually on the bottom left. They're, they're shooting out, and you could actually you can dial in how, what, what angle it's, it's shooting out at. I should do it this way since you're in front of me. And, um, and it's doing that like the, the highest end one we have. We'll do 128 lasers simultaneously, and it's spinning at about 40 hertz. 
And so as we're moving that across the plant canopy, you know, we're really able to piece together a three-dimensional structure of that canopy. And so this was done with a 16-channel LiDAR. Um, but you see, and it, the movement is just to show you that it's a three-dimensional representation of what's happening. And so if you look at the bottom of the screen, those are young plants, nine of them. And then each layer going back is that same plant over a period of about two weeks. And again, this is a much lower resolution LiDAR than what, what we've been using. What do you get from this? Well, you know, you can get certain things like canopy height. And so this is just some data that we've collected and already processed for canopy height, comparing what's measured by hand versus what's measured with the LiDAR. Um, they're excellent correlation. Um, the hand-based measurements are probably driving more variation in our measurement than the LiDAR. Um, we're trying to figure out ways to, to um, uh, quantify that. And, um, uh, uh, you know, and this is just one of many different things we can, we can do. And so again, once you recreate this three-dimensional structure, you can look at leaf angle, leaf size, leaf area index, canopy height, um, you know, so on and so forth. And so just to conclude, um, you know, what are the platforms used for phenotyping? And so, you know, again, this is very, very narrow perspective of all the possibilities that are out there for high throughput phenotyping. Um, but, um, you know, uh, and it's very focused on the field, but, you know, drones are widely used. We have these robots, which are used quite extensively. Um, the, on the right there, that's um, one of our hyperspectral imaging devices. On the bottom is another, you know, and so these are push carts that we push through the field. I include Andrew Leakey's um, image down here because high throughput phenotyping is actually done at the stomata level, which is amazing work, and it, it also qualifies, but again, I'm, I'm focusing more on what, what my lab does. The nice thing about these robots, just to go back really quick, um, uh, one thing about the robots is, you know, we helped, um, Steve Long and I were part of the TerraMet project that helped develop this robot, which goes through the field and makes these types of measurements. But we actually find that this little pull cart that we have on the right-hand side here does a much better job um, because you don't have to worry about whether the robot gets stuck or where it is or if it breaks down. We just pull it through. And so this is as basic of a measurement you can get, but it cuts the amount of time down. And so the LiDAR is actually on the very back of that little wagon right there, and you just pull it through a field. And so that's really great because a lot of these platforms can be really expensive, really involved, and really intensive, or they could be something as simple as just pulling a wagon. And just to end, um, for those of you who are out at the um, um, energy farm yesterday, you might have seen those fall, four really tall towers. And, um, this is a, a, the spider cam system, like what you see at football games. And so this, this, this gantry that appears and disappears as Dolly has all the same sensors, and it's able to move over a four hectare field in order to do this high, high throughput phenotyping um, type of activities. And so that's what I have in terms of the really general view of high throughput phenotyping within the context of, of the field work we do here in Illinois. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I guess how, how easy is it to scale it back to more of a greenhouse level? To I mean, what? Tomorrow, so if I was just working in a greenhouse environment, yeah, and everything you've done here is just on the level above where I am, unfortunately. So, um, so there's a lot, there are a lot of high throughput phenotyping um, activities that are done in, the green, in greenhouses. And so, for example, the spider cam system was, was just built, and so was a high throughput phenotyping greenhouse here on campus, which is actually not far from here. There are some challenges. So when you're in a greenhouse or an artificial growth environment, you know, you have light sources, but generally speaking, you know, LED are the current state of the art, and so they're only emitting in very limited number of wavelengths. And so you can't really get a whole spectrum unless you're dealing with sunlight or unless you upgrade to a sunlight mimicking type of, of, of sensor. Or in the case of some of the high throughput phenotyping greenhouses, there are conveyors that will move them into an enclosure and then make the measurement in there using all these types of sensors. The greenhouse we have here at Illinois has a gantry that just moves over the plant and, and, and the, the thing will move back and forth along okay. the gantry. I wish I had an image of it now. But, um, and so there's a lot that's being done in the greenhouse. Um, and you, you can take a lot of different measurements as well. Do, yeah, so that's, yeah that's and really so awesome. greenhouses are probably... It opens up the potential, yeah, you know, gets me thinking. Yeah, and so one of the things that my lab wants to do, because we're um, uh, working both in the greenhouse and in the spider cam system, is to figure out how to take those exact sense, because the, the, the greenhouse has multi-spectral with a simple LIDAR, whereas the spider cam facility has really high-end LIDAR and really high-end hyperspectral. And so just figuring out ways of, of, of using both facilities simultaneously, you know, so three months of the year everything's out at spider cam, nine months of the year everything's in the greenhouse. Greenhouses are going to be a bit easier because you're getting natural sunlight in there, and so you're getting the whole spectrum.
Um, once you get into growth chambers, it gets a little bit more difficult. But yeah, and, and, and the phenotypes that I represented and the techniques that I've, I've presented here are, are this much compared to probably what's possible. Yeah, well, when you see like the abiotic stresses, you start to think straight away, but exactly how we can translate that into greenhouses. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.